Okay, uh, thanks for uh, coming in to Edinburgh, and I'm sorry I cannot make it. Uh, apparently, uh, two inches of snow at Heathrow prevents me from coming up to Edinburgh, um, but I understand about 25 of you have braved a red uh, red warning into Edinburgh. So, uh, my name is Kieran Mazaria. I am the CEO of Cadence. Uh, as it says on that sheet, Cadence is a partner in invest and discover of development of strategic metals. Now, you may ask, what are strategic metals? Well, strategic metals are the metals that uh, power modern life, really. They are the ones that power uh, are the compounds and minerals that power batteries. And I talk about here about lithium, I talk about cobalt and, and nickel, um, partly as well graphite. Uh, Cadence focus, focuses is it, its investment in the upstream side of that. So it is the discovery, discovery, exploration, development and production of these metals. And in particular, uh, our focus has been for the last uh, four or five years uh, in lithium. I, I attach the disclaimer. Um, I, it's there for your protection, so please read at your leisure. And so the first thing I wanted to do is talk about the strategy and key investments that we have. Uh, there'll be a couple of slides on that. And then I want to maybe, you know, people talk a lot about electric vehicles and talk about the penetration and what they're going to do and transform the way we, how we do it. I want to put a bit of meat around the bones on that because a lot of people, there's lots of per superlatives said uh, and, and often very little evidence provided. Um, and we've been a strong believer in this story since uh, 2012, 2013, and it's really coming to fruition as we stand. So the strategy, look, we're an investment company. We have two pots of investments. Uh, the first are private assets, where we take up to 100% uh, economic stake. Uh, we work with, manage, we're we work with management, are involved with management, and we take it up the steepest value of the section, uh, steepest section of the value curve. What do I mean by that? Well, of course, in exploration and development of mineral assets, the early stage, often where it's the most risk, um, you, you know, when you're going from pre-resource all the way up to, let's call it an economic study, whether that be a PEA, a pre-economic assessment or feasibility, is where the greatest value uh, often is found in investment. And that is, has been the case uh, uh, for us in our investments to date. So we have several private assets, and you can see on that on that on that world map those highlighted in grey. We have a rare earth project. We have a 30% three carry in uh, Australia. We have a, uh, which we recently invested a, an Argentinian early stage prospect in uh, Argentina, where we have a right turn up to 100%. And we have a joint venture with uh, Bacanora Minerals, uh, which is a project coming in to production around 2020, with construction starting in 2018. So that sort of leads uh, quite nicely on to our second pot. Our second pot of investments are public company investments, where we take significant economic stakes in listed exploration and development assets. And our two main ones, we have others, are Bacanora Minerals, where we have approximately 9% of it, and uh, European Metals Holdings, which have 21% of. Those both are world-class assets. Between them, they have a very large uh, mineral resource, uh, somewhere in the, in the region of 14 million tonnes of lithium carbonate equivalent, which is the way that we quote lithium carbonate, lithium elements that we talk about here. And between them, they have about a NPV of uh, $1.75 billion. So, and they're coming to construction uh, construction this year for Bacanora Minerals, and production in 2020 is estimated for Bacanora Minerals, where European Metals probably about one year behind that. And you know those investments, we've invested with them in very early stages when Bacanora Minerals had a tenth of the size of its resource, has delivered some excellent returns for us, where we've uh, over the last two years. Uh, I haven't included the years before, it's delivered about a cumulative return of about 120%. We've done that by identifying assets that have strategic cost advances. That's about grade, essentially. And our misprice, Bacchanora's misprice, because people didn't believe it could produce lithium carbonate from its clay. We did the research, did the extensive due diligence, and knew that it could. Uh, European metals, people saw that the grade of the lithium was low, but ultimately it had a massive tin and tongue particularly tin credit, which meant its cost of production was both in the lower cost quartile. So you can see our approach there. 
Um, and in addition, you know, in the public assets, we may invest in uh, other lithium projects, but non to non-material amounts where we see uh, buying opportunities. So how does that stack up in our value proposition? Well, I've divided up and very simply in investment value and growth. The investment that we've made to date uh, across these assets, including the private and public, is around 19 million. That is uh, roughly where our market capitalization sits. And the value of the equity we hold is roughly where our, our market capitalization sits. The value is, and if you look at, uh, is, is around 36 million. Now, how do I derive that 36 million? Well, that is, in, in essence, the public value of the, uh, of the shares that we hold, uh, plus the uh, attributed value to the joint venture that we have with Bacanora on the Mexilet JV, which adds considerable value. So even in there, if you take the public quoted values, uh, you end up with a substantial upside there of £36 million in, um, compared to our market cap. And I suppose the growth is where we're all looking in these type of assets, where both particularly European Metal Holdings and Bacanora both have substantial NPVs, uh, as I said, about £1.75 billion. And if we were to main our equity, retain our equity position, um, you know, that could be worth to us, assuming they both come to production in the region of £200 million. So as you can see there, there is, uh, you know, our investment strategy is clear about where we're taking and investing our money. And you can see the potential of current value and obviously the growth should they be successful and coming to fruition and production. And that's interesting uh, and that's uh, all good. But I suppose one of the things that people do ask uh, is, well, this lithium hype, what's it all about? I mean, we see plenty of news flow about it. We see electric vehicles, we see batteries being Volkswagen plants, leak from Tesla. But are there drivers for this? Are there drivers that lithium and the electric vehicles that drive the demand for lithium is it, it, true? So I tend to look at history and I also, uh, you know, I'm going to look at a bit of history and I'm also going to look at the evidence where capital is being invested by the electric vehicle manufacturers or the, or the battery manufacturers. So let's go back. And I think this is the, what my point I was trying to make is that the speed, we're underestimating the speed of penetration of the electric vehicle, which is going to be exponential, and the rate at which we can meet that lithium demand, i.e. construction of mining project, is quite often linear. So there is going to be a, a, a supply-demand gap. So if I look at the history, there's a famous quote here from uh, uh, Henry Ford's lawyer, Horace Rackham, um, uh, recommending not to invest Ford more, more company because uh, he believed the internal combustion engine was a fad. And that might be some of the poorest investment advice given. But nonetheless, if you look at his environment, this was in 1908, a picture of the uh, Easter Day Parade in New York. And the only internal combustion engine or car or vehicle there is the one highlighted in a red circle. So in that environment, of course, it's a sensible thing. It's a fad. There's one in, I don't know, 200 there. 20 years later, I would challenge you to spot the uh, horse-drawn carriage. Basically, it's going from a penetration rate from basically 1% or less than 1% in 20 years to in excess of 80 to 90%. And that's not because it's a derivation from petrol to diesel. It's what we call a disruptive technology. It's a technology that, um, in essence, has a lower cost, um, is more efficient, and completely displaces incumbent transport. And that's what internal combustion engine does. And what I'm arguing, and what lots of people are saying, is effectively that the electric vehicle is, in essence, the uh, the ice engine to the horse draw horse powered carriage the electric vehicle and ai combined eventually will replace and probably represent 90% of the miles driven in about 10 to 20 years depending on legislation now that's a pretty bold statement and it is well, what i'm saying is electric vehicles are on disruptive technology so you know what is the history is there any evidence from this well there's this guy called tony sieber who looked at everything from the printing press which uh, allowed the uh, dissemination of the gutterburn bible all the way to tablets and seed saw how these 
penetration rates occurred and what were the common characteristics. And if you can see, these are the adoption rates of some amazing pieces of technology, whether it be the cell phone, the color TV, uh, social media, smartphone, tablets. You can see that they appear from nowhere, and then suddenly within 20 years, they're at 80%. What are the characteristics that make these things occur? Well, one of them is, uh, well, I'm going to focus on two, really. The, the, the first is the lowering of the cost curve. So when you see exponential drops in cost curves, uh, i.e. what you saw with Moore's law with the computer technology, yeah, and you have several of those combining, then you see a cost saving that is uh, undeniable and it becomes an economic imperative to, to effectively adopt this technology. So batteries are a classic example. You know, we're seeing that the cost per kilowatt hour from 2005 was about 1,400. In 2014, which is a, a bit old, is, it was 400. And it's probably going to sit around in forecasts around the uh, 150 mark by 2020, which is a 10 times improvement in value. You see the same in electric motors. You see the same in, a, in things like solar panels, et cetera. And when these things combine, and in computer power, and so when these things combine, you start to see massive savings in the electric vehicle, the purchase of electric vehicle. What we find is because of the combination of batteries and electric motors, you get a much more efficient uh, use of power. EVs are five times more efficient. An average ICE engine, basically, 20% uh, of uh, the incredible fuel density that exists within petrol or diesel gets put put up in smoke and, 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 and light and heat, while electric vehicles that gets driven to taking you forward. And therefore, they're cheaper to charge and fuel. They're five to 10 times cheaper to charge and fuel, and they're cheaper to maintain. They're about 10, 10 times less moving parts. Why electric vehicles offer you free servicing? Because there's no servicing to do on them apart from tires. So when you see this 10 times economic improvement, a disruption of incumbent technology and business model will occur. Evidence is there. So what I'm saying is that electric vehicles, which are the primary driver at the moment, I, I notice I'm not mentioning stationary, stationary storage, it, the electric vehicles are the primary driver for the demand of these strategic metals and therefore are critical uh, to, the, to the future and uptake of these, uh, of these electric vehicles. And you can see here these um, electric vehicle forecasts. You can see that, as on a conservative basis, we're talking about 23% penetration in new car sales by 2025. Most people believe that by 2022 or thereabouts, and this is US dollars, of course, because it's a US, uh, slightly US bias uh, report, uh, the average EV cost will be about $22,000 for an average low-end car, giving the mileage that people need. Uh, and it, it, it would be nonsensical to buy anything else uh, uh, than the EV. And, you know, what is the evidence? Is there capital being expanded? Well, yeah. You know, 2014, 39 gigawatt hours in terms of battery capacity, that's the production of new lithium ion cells, was installed. The current commitments and plans that have been announced up to 2017 is 330 gigawatt hours, which is about $334 billion worth of, dollars worth of capital investments that have been announced or planned. Forecasts would suggest that we'd need up to 709 gigawatt hours required by 2025 to hit sort of 20% 20, 20 penetration rates. So you can see there both that the historical evidence exists to show that electric vehicles will ultimately penetrate this market quite substantially and that people like Panasonic, like Tesla, like BYD, are investing or plan to invest on LG Chem as well, plan to invest substantial capital uh, to, in the battery and, and lithium-ion batteries. The large majority of this will be for electric vehicles. So when you look at that and you look at the supply, we do our own analysis. What does supply look like? Well. Exploration, development projects all have risks, and we risk each of these projects to understand the supply. And when I look at these projects for 2025, you can see that advanced exploration barely appears on that diagram, and current production, feasibility projects, pre-feasibility projects, and that's, that's under construction. You can see a substantial increase in lithium uh, carbonate, which will go into the lithium-ion batteries. But when you marry that with the demand curve, 
really you can see that tw post-2023, we have got a deficit. Um, the, the figure in 2020 to 2022, I probably need to update because there's some things that have happened in the supply side that mean that that falls below that demand curve. And it only requires one project not to be successful, not to be cap uh, not to have enough capital, not to arrive on time for these this to be pushed out. So there is a real excellent supply demand curve. And I'm not going to forecast prices here, but this is uh, uh, Deutsche Bank's forecast. Uh, and yes, you see 2021 because of that possible uh, in increase in supply, a bit of a reduction. But you have to remember that we're talking that. In two or three years ago, lithium carbonate was priced at $6,000 a ton. At the moment, right now, it's around $16,000 a ton. So these are conservative forecasts, to say, this, and the pro say the least. And the projects that we've invested in, um, in their NPV models, are using forecasts around the nine dollars to $10,000, which is very conservative in my view. So what do we have? We have a favorable S&D curve that I say, uh, I've shown. In addition, you know, lithium's been around, and make no bones about it. There's been plenty of lithium. There's plenty of lithium in, in the ground. Ex the, however, the exploration space is undeveloped, and there's investment opportunities. So I'm quickly going to go through uh, uh, our projects. Um, I want to maybe just focus on one, uh, and then look at our investments and wrap up. So our primary project that we've that we're getting involved with and taking a, a great deal of effort in um, is this Argentine lithium prospects, which we got involved in tail end of last year. And it's, uh, you know, Argentin Argentina has had some uh, bad rap, uh, but recently the new president has removed 5% on lithium on tax, 5% tax on lithium. And it will represent, Argentina as one of the big producers, will represent 23% of uh, production by 2025. We secured prospective areas, uh, which is around 50, 56,000 hectares on a spodumene bearing pegmatite field with very high grades. And we've de-risked ourselves in the sense that we approach it on the basis that, you know, we're going to be involved with management, uh, verify the exploration program, involved with uh, expediting that as much as possible, and only contribute uh, once certain success successes are occurred, whether that be identifying a drill target, uh, mineralization, with the idea of achieving a uh, uh, starting drilling by H2 of 2018. What we're going to do th in, in this quarter is start our prospecting program and uh, and then in Q2 this year, uh, begin the spodumene sampling and with drilling and hopefully, if there is a suitable target, define a mineral resource in the, by the tail end of this year. Now, what does that mean? I mean, I suppose, you know, how does that deliver value to, to Cadence? And I think this is where where you look at resources and 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 what people generally use in the market to value resources uh, is is taking the resource uh, of lithium carbonate or it could be gold or silver and dividing it by uh, the enterprise value. And you can see here um, a very wide spread. Obviously, some of these are in production. Galaxies uh, in production or coming close to production, and some of these are very close to production. And you can see that uh, per ton, it's around 310, 320 on a weighted average uh, or, uh, per ton of lithium carbonate. So if we will be able to, say, go for a typical target, which we would like to target, it's about 25 million tons, 1.2 Li2, we'd end up an enterprise value somewhere in the region of 300 million. So you can see with low risk, uh, uh, with a low risk in terms of investment, um, obviously, this perspective, so there's this expiration, so there's risks associated with that. There could be substantial upside uh, for cadence. So, I want to talk about the investments now. I, we've we've gone over some of them already, uh, but I wanted to show how we've performed. Uh, so these are the last two years. You can see that uh, reiterating that our investments have performed uh, very well, 120% return, cumulative absolute cumulative returns. The idea was to uh, in outperform the lithium index that we've created uh, and for most of the last two years we have and uh, at the moment we're slightly out outperforming but nonetheless that's uh, it, it's it's based on our uh, PL the profit that we've been making on those investments I wanted to actually highlight this and I think it's an important one it's one of our investments is European metal holdings and it's in the center just above that skoda badge uh, that's where the asset is. And you can see the commitments 
that major car manufacturers are making to electric vehicles. And car manufacturers don't really want to have their drive drivetrain out, outsourced. Uh, so I really feel that, uh, and battery manufacturers, I really feel that ultimately something like European Metals Holding and the Cinevec deposit will become part of a local supply chain within Europe uh, which will be part and parcel of one of the major electric vehicle manufacturers because it's such a, uh, a, a such an excellent asset with great cost curves and very close to uh, its potential customers. So in summary, you know, we, we're, we're a company that I feel poised for some upside here. Um, current market cap is backed by our equity positions that we have. And there is still upside in those equity positions as they come to production and development. For Bacanora, that is, of course, in uh, 2020 or around 2020, with construction starting 2018, subject to finance. And with hopefully with EMH, that's a year after that. So when you have that, there's upside on that. In addition, there's little or no uh, value being attributed to some of our other assets, which include uh, the Maxlit JV, which is part of uh, the Bacanora mine plan. Yes, it's in year seven or, or thereabouts, but nonetheless, there's value in it. And of course, if Argentina is successful, uh, we could see substantial upside there. So I put, uh, it's an older uh, analyst valuation, so you can see what uh, on a price per uh, pence per share, what analysts have valued us uh, uh, over the last, I think it was last year. And uh, you can see there the substantial upside. So given that, given that we're in a fastest, uh, uh, fastest growing area in the mining sector, I believe with 20, 40% compound annual growth rates, there is a, there, there's a substantial upside for us. And I really haven't touched here one thing which is interesting is the energy storage market, which faces the same sort of energy disruption that electric vehicles uh, are, 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 are disrupting at the moment, in that I think peak gas, uh, it is now cheaper to install uh, the same amount of gigawatt hours uh, with uh, solar panels and uh, energy story than it is to put in a new peak gas electric electricity provider. It's cheaper, in fact. So that being said, uh, I think that's the end. Uh, I, I think I'm running out of time anyhow. So uh, the team, I, my background is an engineer uh, and in finance, and the rest of the board, non-executive executive, are fund managers or head fund, hedge fund managers providing a bit uh, of market intelligence on that. Hello. Um, what is the advantage that you have over the big boys like RT, uh, Rio Tinto or BHP and some of them have actually advocated that the way to play the EV market is copper. What would you say to that? Okay, so what was the second? I didn't quite hear the second part of the question. The EV market the, is... The, I think the, it was, um, the way to play it is via copper. Okay, uh, well, uh, uh, not to be disparaged about Rio Tinto and the large guys, they're not involved in, in lithium generally. Rio Tinto has had its Serbian asset uh, for 10 years. And that is that is a that is that is a big uh, lithium deposit in Europe. Uh, it hasn't completed its PFS as yet. They are they want to get involved in the lithium market because they really haven't been been involved in it at all. The big guys involved in the lithium market are diversified chemical producers or were SQM 10 years ago, or even less than that six years ago, uh, lithium represented 12% of EBITDA, and then you have Albemarle and uh, less so FMC. So actually, the big guys are new guys. They're people like Galaxy. Um, SQM ultimately will be the largest producer of lithium in the world. That's certainly my belief. And the projects that they get involved in will be incredibly successful. So, uh, it, it, you know, the, the, the big guys we'll talk about the way to get into EV market is copper. I think as far as their portfolio, absolutely correct, because their portfolio is about producing copper. And of course, you'll need to uh, put copper into electric motors. I mean, that's a critical part of it. But ultimately, the biggest growth in uh, commodity demand and lithium carbon, it's not really a commodity as well, in mineral compound demand will be in the lithium. We look at lithium, cobalt and nickel. They all have their, those are the key elements as far as I'm concerned. Nickel 
I think will be replaced. Uh, I don't think we'll have any problem meeting that demand within the current uh, supply and demand curve. Lithium is the one that has has got ultimately the strongest S&D curve, given the low base it's coming from and how critical it is to the lithium ion battery. Because ultimately, as uh, a guy from BSF said to me, the replacement for lithium ion battery is a lithium ion battery. Okay, Kieran, um, I think we're probably going to wrap up there. And um, thank you very much indeed. I know it must be quite tricky doing that remotely, but um, you came across very well, as I said. So thank you very much, Kieran. Thank you.